man. They're off in the Red Smith handicap. And Dave is roaring down the center of the racetrack. And here comes Dave. Dave up to take the lead. Cute Cognac in behind horses. And Cute Cognac is kicking in, kicking in in a big way. Here comes Cute Cognac, who's roaring up on the outside. And Cute Cognac comes on to win. Join Saratoga's original racing partnership. Visit us online at partingglassracing.com. This is the OTB Communications Network. Now, Track Facts with Tom Amello and Nick Kling. Good morning, racing fans, and welcome to Track Facts Live. I'm Tom Amello. I'm sitting here on the backstretch of Saratoga. We're here for the next 50 minutes to do the uh, Travers postmortem. I'm here on the backstretch with uh, my good friend Nick Kling, handicapper for the record, and our special guest today, Carrie Fotius, uh, creator of the extras from Equiform.com author of Blinkers Off, and yes, fellas, this is a Travers postmortem because a lot of handicappers, public handicappers especially, were buried yesterday on what was one of the great cards that we've had in a long time here. Well, there's no question about it, Tom. It was a great day of racing here at Saratoga. Twelve tremendous races, uh, no claiming races, uh, terrific fields, uh, wonderful betting opportunities, and most of us got buried under the avalanche. And, and we're hoping we get some callers who uh, uh, got a piece of, uh, of some of those big payoffs from yesterday. Um, Carrie, uh, I think yesterday's card uh, you know, points out to what the opportunities are when we get full fields. Well, that's the thing. I mean, being a value player as I am, I love these kind of cards. I mean, there's a lot of days like yesterday you're just going to get skunked, which <laughs> I did until I caught the horse in the last race. But I was in position for some big scores like that race, the turf race where Baron Von Top went right. out in 40. I had the 13 and the 1 run down with the box with the field and tries. If the 1 gets up for third, I'm walking out of there with a dollar for, you know, triple would it pay a hundred thousand for two dollars? A dollar and a dream. Yeah, a yeah. So, 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 so I'm, I'm saying you can afford to lose a lot of races when you put yourself in a position to score for fifty thousand. Yeah, I, th I think that's an excellent point. Uh, you know, and it's it's uh, it's something that public handicappers don't do. Public right. handicappers are trying to pick winners. Players are trying to put themselves in position to get something out of score. the win pool. Okay, 518-581-1770 uh, is the phone number. Docfonda at telenet.net is the uh, email. You can contact us electronically. Nick is monitoring those emails now. And uh, speaking of email. Yes, yeah, speaking I, of email. I, I have to tell, if, if there are listeners out there that have sent me email in the last week, I finally got them this morning. Uh, they were trapped in my spam filter. So from sometime during last Sunday's show until this morning, I checked my spam filter and I've finally gotten your email so you will get a response it'll just be delayed about a week okay the phone lines are open we're gonna go down to Manhattan and talk to Bill Bill welcome to the program uh, question or comment for the panel or Carrie in particular uh, comment I want to talk about Big Brown please yes sure. sir okay uh, if you get a copy of the Daily News the day after the Belmont they had full color pictures of Big Brown yep if you look I've been around horses a long time. His tongue was tied wrong. His tongue is blue. You can see it in that program. His head halter, he didn't have a dropped head halter or a figure eight. He had a regular head halter. It was down too close to the bit. When the jock pulled back, he pinched on the horse's mouth. His tongue was already blue. When DeSormo pulled him to the outside, even though this horse scoped clean, some, they're always looking for the bruise. Horses flip their palate and put it back, and people don't realize it. Now, when he raced again last week, for, you know, a couple of weeks ago, and it looked like he was dead, and he came back, it looked to me like the whole, I couldn't, I don't know about the tongue on that day, but the halter was still down 
two loads. It's just a regular halter he's got on him. And it looked like he might have lost his air and come back. Sometimes you got to put these horses on a treadmill so you can tell that they've really flipped or not. Now, of course, with this horse, you're not going to go and do that. But I really believe that that's the mystery to what happened to this horse. Nobody's picked up on it. Get the daily news and you will from the day afterwards, and you will see his tongue is definitely blue. The assistant trainers, whoever it is, Mistakes get made, and that is the reason I think Big Brown has done what he's done. And if you look back even at Gulfstream Park, when he came out of the 12th hole, he was very uncomfortable. He was ranked that day. His head was, if you look at his head, his head was not comfortable at all, and I wouldn't doubt that he might have been getting pinched then, too. Okay, Bill, uh, you've made your point. Uh, thanks for the call. Uh, I have to tell you that uh, I have no clue about equipment. Uh, you know, I, I look at it on the horse. I understand what a tongue tie is. Uh, I hope one of our crack staff between now and next week can maybe find a picture of uh, that picture he's talking about uh, in the Daily News. But uh, that's, he, that's interesting. Go ahead. As he called Dutro. <laughs> Why don't you call Dutro <laughs> yeah. and uh, uh, see, see if he's got an opinion on it. But that's certainly one of the, if not the most interesting theory I've heard on Big Brown's uh, you know, uh, uncharacteristic performance of the Belmont. Certainly, it's right up there. Yeah, uh, I, I think also is the whole notion of uh, of the tongue tie. You know, some folks are kind of uh, uh, put off when they see it, but uh, I mean, it's in regular use uh, every day. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go to Scotia talk to Tom. Tom, welcome to the show. Question or comment? It's uh, great to uh, be on the show. Are you coming? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead, sir. Hello? Oh, okay, we lost We it. lost time right, from Carrie, uh, While we're waiting for, uh, for a caller here, why don't you talk about your day yesterday and, uh, you know, how you tried to attack the day and, um, and, and what do you see next? I mean, let's talk a little bit about the Travers. It was a great race, uh, and I think everybody was somewhat surprised that it ran to form, if you will. Well, well, I'll tell you something. I made the biggest, although it was for a friend of mine, my buddy Nick Morden, who yeah, lives sure. in this area yeah. and does yeah. work on a lot of European horses. He makes numbers there. <clears throat> so I wanted to treat him to lunch, you know, on, on one of the day this week. And he showed up, and I was out in the backyard or smoking or doing something, and he left, and he put his money down before I could pick up the tab. So I called him up. I said, hey, Nick, you got a, you know, $30 bet. On the, we got out cheap that day, 30 in the carousel. You got a $30 bet on the Travers. So he comes yesterday, and he played it cold, a $30 super. That was his investment for his $30. And he, uh, he almost hit it, believe it or not. You know, it was all the favorites. He had a mishmashed up. But uh, it was okay. a great, it was a very good, I liked Mambo in Seattle myself. I thought Cool Coal Man was a little bit of value yeah. at that price. And I took my shot. He fooled, and, Cool Coal Man fooled a lot of people. I think yeah. a lot of folks liked his middle move uh, yeah. uh, at Monmouth, right. and, uh, but he just didn't just, fire. No, just, just didn't fire. Uh, speaking of... Uh, Mambo in Seattle, we can, we can go right to uh, this email we got from Paul and Cohoes. Uh, you know, Paul's, I, I won't read the whole email, but the bottom line is, is that, first of all, he wants to know, are we absolutely sure that photo finish cameras and their positioning is accurate? And number two, uh, you know, the gist of his, his question is, is, is that the fairest way to determine the winner? Because you know, now first of all, I have I had no dog in this hunt. I liked Harlem Rocker, but you know, if you look at at the race, Mambo in Seattle would have won the photo if it had been taken in about if you'd taken the photo in about ten different positions, except you know, that position. Ex ex yeah, <laughs> you know, in about a three feet span right. around the Every wire. Every other he's the he's winner. Ahead, right. There was one place. Where same thing the day before with Ginger Punch, and right. I was on the losing end of both of them. You know, I mean, Colonel John, and I, I did see the photo, and, and there was a definite margin. You could see the gap in front of uh, Mambo and Seattle's nose, but it was about, you know, a half my little finger right. thick. Right. So, I, you know, Paul raises a question. I, you know, I, I don't know any other fairer way to do it. I think the photos are accurate. I don't know why you would dispute that, but... You know, uh, any opinions here, gentlemen? Well, uh, I, I think the only thing, in, in every place else, it's not a photo finish. It's stopping a teletimer, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. In, in real, uh, no, in, in human racing and, and auto <clears throat> racing. Well, if we uh, went to that chip methodology yeah. Yeah. or like they do yeah. it. Uh, Someday we might. Yeah. But I think, you know, right now, I think, you know, I think, I think in the old days, 
uh, you know, who knows, maybe the Carter, 1944 Carter <laughs> Handicap wouldn't have been a triple dead heat if we had today's right. technology. So right. I guess it's the best, that's what we got for now. Uh, we're going to stay here in Saratoga, talk to Bob. Bob, welcome to the show. Question or comments? Good morning to the three wise guys. That's right. Mo, Larry, and Karen. Excuse me, wise men. <laughs> oh, no, wise guys. I know, I know. All right, Bob, what do you got? Well, first of all, uh, I, I did use Colonel John a little bit yesterday, uh, reluctantly, but only because of the sheets I used. And the, I, when the race was over, I, I thought I lost it. I, I really did. But the first time they showed the replay, I knew I won because you could see Colonel John's head come down just for a flash of a second. Yep. And it was the only time you could see his beak in front of that of Mambo in Seattle. And I just feel bad for Alvarado. That's two years in a row that two inches have cost him 60,000 mm. bucks. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it was, a, it was a great race, a tremendous card. If he, if he hadn't emerged before yesterday, it was a hell of a coming out party for Alan Garcia. Mm. Uh, Excellent you know, point. Because he not only rode five winners, he rode each one of those horses really the way they were supposed to be ridden, whether it was up front or like with Visionaire. He only, his only shot was he to take back and hope speed stopped a little. And he did all that. And uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say, and I'll be real brief. I, I have called numerous times, and I know you don't like it when I do it, to criticize OTB people, on-air people and stuff. I had a conversation about a week ago. I happened to stop by your TV tent there when I was over in the morning, and I bumped into Gene Wood, who I've not always agreed with on certain things. And I have to tell you that after talking to that person and realizing the time and the depth of her commitment to racing as a sport and everything like that, my whole opinion has changed. She was interesting, informed, knowledgeable, and I just thought it was a happenstance meeting, and it was terrific. And my hats off to her. Well, we're, we're, thanks, Bob. Thanks for the call. We're delighted that uh, you found out about Gene. What we here at the, the network have known for a long time. Go ahead, well, Carrie. Well, here they come, round of the wire. Mambo on the outside. Colonel John digging in on the inside. Here, I really thought the nine was going to go by here. Absolutely. It still looks like it wanted to be. I just, <laughs> it's kind it's of almost like John Henry in the bar. Absolutely. It's, it's that's what I was going to say. Right? Thing I could compare it to. Yeah, yeah no, no question about it. And, and by the way, I, I didn't like any of the horses coming out of the Jim Dandy, but you have to uh, give a, 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 a little something to Macho again, who had one of the worst trips you are ever going to see. That horse got battered from yep. pillar to post. For uh, you know, about the quarter pole. The tar held on pretty well, I thought. The tar held yeah, on yeah, pretty well. Yeah. I got a little bit of a thrill from Harlem Rocker, but I, you know, the the slow pace and the wide trip, and probably the mile and a quarter did him in. He might be able to compete with those horses at a mile yeah. and eighth, but yeah. uh, I, I think his best games probably. I think he, he's you know cigar mile that yeah. type of rail, one well turn be. mile or seven foot yeah, long I, horse. I, I think we should also talk a little bit about Colonel John, uh, in in so far as. The key, there are two questions. Number one, you know, the switch from all weather to dirt, which bothered some people and didn't bother a lot of folks. And the other question was really the quality of his derby race. If, if you looked at the derby race as more positive than negative, then, uh, you know, uh, you, you could feel that this was a horse who perhaps right. was sitting on a race. That, 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 I mean, all credit to Colonel John, Ewan Hardy, I'm, I'm, you know, this has always been a good, steady horse, but... You know, being a figure maker like I am, this is still a you know a very very uh, you know subpar crop of well, three years in terms of in terms slow of the but competitive. Slow, group. but that makes for good betting yeah. races. Uh, we're going to go to Menans now. Talk to Bruce. Bruce, uh, thanks for calling. Question or comment? A couple of questions. Yes, uh, sir. What happened to the bobbleheads this year with the giveaways? They decided not to do it. End of story. And the second question is, when I hear that the, uh, on turf races where they say that the portable rail is set at a certain feet, what does that mean, and what does that mean to a better? Excellent question. Nick? Well, uh, <laughs> caller, uh, you know, the, the portable rail are um, used to, uh, when, when, when they start, <laughs> yesterday they raced on the hedge. 
So let's say that you start a race meet and horses are racing on the hedge and eventually the inside couple of paths get chewed up from all the traffic. So they put out the portable rail to move them out, uh, you know, anywhere from 9, 12, or 18 feet to give them fresh grass to race on. Now, the general consensus has been, and, and I think it's relatively accurate, when the portable rail is up on a conventional Oops. turf course like uh, um, Aqueduct or here at Saratoga, it's probably favoring horses that come from off the pace. Um, you know, sometimes it works out that way, sometimes it doesn't. Now, interestingly, yesterday they took the rails down. You would have thought the inside would be the best place for the turf horses to race. You would have thought the speed would have done well, uh, or horses coming up the fence would have done particularly well on turf, and it wasn't always necessarily that way yesterday. I think Tom had it right. We were talking before the show. We had a couple of uh, wire jobs on the turf here Friday, and uh, as a result, some of the pace fractions in the turf races yesterday were faster than what <laughs> you'd expected. So apparently, some of the riders thought that you know the same thing that we might have. Go that fast the and Inside win. speed would do well on the turf yesterday, <laughs> and as a result, we had these outside closers getting up to win. Yeah, Carrie uh, uh, is a figure maker. Um, it sounds intellectually to me, because I don't make figures, right. that moving the rails out would affect the figures. Well, it, well, it doesn't affect the figures. I mean, it affects you have to adjust for how much okay. distance the horse has traveled, okay? But what's interesting is a counterpoint to what Nick said. Talk to someone who plays the West Coast tracks like I do a lot, and what I found over the years, at the, the rails out actually favors the speed horses. Right. I've never kind of noticed it one way or the other in New York, but I think in the California tracks, you know, it, maybe it's just because it's it's you're out further. It's harder if you're on the outside. The, the centrifugal force there. To, but I, I just find speed does better mm -hmm. on the California tracks when the rails are out. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's a a thing you can generalize on. Yeah, I think it's idiosyncratic. You've got to know what's going on at your local mm -hmm. circuit. Oh, we're going to go back to the phone lines. Five one eight five eight one one seven seven zero. Uh, we're going to stay here in uh, upstate New York, go to Boston Lake, talk to Neil. Neil, welcome to the show. Question or comment? Hello? Well, it's Leo. Leo? And, uh, yeah. Hi, Leo. Uh, my comment is I think you guys ought to give a, a salute to Linda Rice because last week uh, she had four horses in a <laughs> race, and they ran one, two, three, four, not coupled, and what was... Uh, Interesting to me was that her two gold uh, jockeys are Cornelio Velasquez and Alan Garcia, and neither one of them were on any of the four horses. So I think it's congratulations to Linda. She did a heck of a job in that race. Great point, Leo. Thanks for the call. And so, fellas, a track track salute to uh, Linda Rice and anybody who had the prescience to box. <laughs> All right. The, the only thing that can top that, she still hasn't caught Dickinson with his one, two, three, four, five finish right. in the Chetelum Gold Cup. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. The, the, the interesting thing about that is... I thought that... I thought that the, the, uh, what's it, the, the super or the try they come back a little light. Well, well whatever. You know, I'm sure there are plenty <laughs> yeah. of people that were boxing the rice, uh, the rice horses. Uh, you know, the, the bottom line, I think, that, that and, and it's interesting, nobody that I've heard has complained about this. Uh, I'm in favor of uncoupled entries like we had in that race. And as it happened, uh, Naira President Charlie Hayward came up to the press box later that afternoon and pointed out if that had been an allowance or a maiden race, you know, there wouldn't have been four separate betting interests right. there. I think there might have been two or something like that. I've forgotten the exact uh, ownership uh, you know, connections there. There might even have only been one entry if it had been a maiden race. So, you know, I mean, that, that race to me is a prime example of why in uh, all but perhaps claiming races we should have uncoupled entries. It gives betters a chance to score out if they have a good opinion. Oh, I, I agree, absolutely. We're going to stay here in upstate New York at the Clifton Park and talk to Phil. Phil, welcome back to the show. Yeah, hi. How are you guys? Good morning, We're good. Phil. Yeah. Uh, one thing i got to say, uh, Bob's got better eyes than anybody else. If he could see that the, uh, the horse uh, that uh, <laughs> Colonel John dropped his head just before the wire. I mean, we don't need photo finish cameras, but that's beside the point. Uh, 
Uh, Garcia is doing a, an amazing job here. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't believe that uh, a lot of these jockeys got sucked into speed duels yesterday when it was obvious that uh, everything was, uh, basically everything was coming from way back. And uh, sometimes I wonder, sometimes I wonder about their intelligence when they get trapped into something like that. I mean, you're out there five, six, seven times a day. I mean, you should get a handle on what the racetrack is doing. And uh, uh, some of these guys, uh, uh, for lack of a better word, are not too bright about it. Uh, I understand that it matters on the, the type of horse that you're riding. I do understand that. But... Uh, uh, hey, let me, let me tell you this, Phil. Here's Mary Thanks Spence. Thanks for the call. A-Rod makes $26 million a year, and he makes a few weirs along the way. So <laughs> uh, that, That's interesting, too. Now, I, the other thing, there are two things. First of all, uh, horses are basically prisoners of running style. I mean, if you're a front runner, you're going to the front, unless, unless you're going to rip your face off. Uh, and the other thing is we, you don't know what instructions a jock may have been given uh, in the paddock. You know, go fast and win and, and see what happens. Uh, Nikki, any emails? Uh, we do have an email. Uh, uh, Paul, uh, you know, wanted to mention uh, that on ESPN they thought that uh, Mambo in Seattle had uh, won the photo. But, uh, you know, I, I think that in, unless you saw the picture, there was no way that you could guess what it was going to be. Uh, you know, when, when you saw the slow-mo, you might have had an opinion, but it wasn't necessarily going to be the right one. Well, I, uh, we also got an email from uh, John uh, who wanted to point out that um, he had Colonel John in the exacta. You know, we asked for, for that. He also mentioned he liked the Jimmy Jerkins first there yesterday, Storm Storm play. play, and you know, I I, I got to say that was one that uh, you know I was ready to jump off the bridge myself. I liked everything about the horse except no Lasix. Yeah. And Jimmy Jerkins wins <clears throat> about three times as often with first-time starters with Lasix. Was that it, the Smart Strike horse? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. The, what a sire yeah. he's turned. Yep, yeah, yep. And turf you know, too. Tremendous <laughs> everything. Turf tremendous too. pedigree on yeah. that horse, and, and he looked good. And, <laughs> Dr. Kling, if, if I may, you know, we say from this forum quite often that those stats that we quote and look at and rely on, they're predictors, but not yeah. determiners, eh? Yeah, 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 well, you numbers, guys. <laughs> you know. uh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, I just want you to know that uh, through, through communication between my good friend uh, Nick, he earned his first N on the speed list. You know, mean he's, a N as in speed as in figure nitwit? With, speedy, uh -huh. figure nitwit, yeah. He's earned an N. Anyhow, <laughs> we're going back to the phone line, talk to Barry in Clifton Park. Barry, thanks for calling. Question or comment? Larry, question yes. or comment? Yes, I, I was wondering what happened to uh, the million and a half that no one uh, hit on that super protector in the seventh race. Well, I didn't, I, I, okay, that's a good question. Uh, the, the bottom line is that uh, had it been... Uh, hit for uh, for everything. That's what it would have been, would have paid. But I think there were ten cent payouts. Well, uh, first of all, there wasn't a million and a half dollars in the pool caller. Uh, here, here's the bottom line, and I absolutely, completely, and one hundred percent agree with the uh, Daily Racing Form Steve Christ about this. You have to report to make it sensible. All payoffs have to be reported in two dollar increments, the way you know the, in the traditional way. So. The bottom line was there were two people, two tickets that hit that that super for ten cents, you know. So there was after the takeout there was something like a hundred and fifty some thousand dollars in the pool. So the total pool was something a little over two hundred thousand, and it was reported in a two dollar increment because if you start if every racetrack decided I'm going to report this in a dollar. This and no. fifty cents. cents. This and, 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 and you this, just it, can't and, do. It. And this has, but it, but it's not happening. And that, I mean, I bet on, you know, I bet from home most of the time. You look up on the screen, Arlington. You got the the Quinella comes back two dollars. The tries a fifty cent try. Right. You know the this is that. It's it just it's my uniform. I mean, yeah. You know, or, or some of these tracks now when they report the prices like Delta Down, some of these, you know, van they report the dollar win price. <laughs> I mean, right. Even that's not sacrosanct. We've got to take a commercial break. Uh, it's eleven o'clock. We've got about uh, 25 minutes here before we send you down to Ciro's for the uh, DRF seminar. Tom Amello, Nick Kling, and Carrie Fodius. Please stay with us.
We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom Amello, Nick Kling, and Carrie Fotius here on the um, on the backstretch, and uh, we have breaking news for you from Capital OTB for our upstate Capital OTB audience. Uh, Capital off track today with a with a carryover here in Saratoga of over one hundred forty eight thousand dollars. Capital off track is giving handicapper Dick Powell a thousand dollars for a pick six play today, a pick six promotion. Patrons. May send, hello, may send uh, an email to viewer mail at capitalotb.com at 1 o'clock, not before 1 o'clock. In order to be eligible, 10 Capital Off Track customers will be selected to participate in uh, this Pick 6 promotion. Uh, you must use your Capital uh, PhotoBet account, Capital Bets account today. That's one of the prerequisites. And uh, you must be uh, willing to uh, sign a uh, W-9 form, an IRS form, should handicapper Dick Powell uh, bring home the bacon. So uh, that's breaking news from Capital Off Track on a, on a promotion that uh, is pretty good. So uh, let's uh, wish handicapper Dick Powell a um, successful pick six. Yeah, I'm looking at this and saying that uh, that's that's all right. Go, Mr. Powell. I was contemplating a few numbers here. Okay, thank you so much for the help in the trailer. All right, uh, we're going to go to the Bronx and talk to Steve. Steve, how are you? Welcome to the show. Steve, you there? Hello. Hello, Hello there. Steve. Question or comment? Yeah, a comment. Yes, sir. I want to know why jockeys. Hello? Yeah, why what? Yeah. Why jockeys don't ride out their mound? When they entered the wire in the nine twenty yesterday, um, Ken, when Chucky is um, almost getting Ken, Ken stop right. Right. Okay. okay. If you reel back the tape, you can see, it, and it happened all the while. Chucky stop right their mouth, but then they lose exactly. They lose the chip. Right? Okay. When they get caught, they stop right out their mouth. Okay. Thanks for the call. The question is about uh, persevering <laughs> through the wire. Uh, that's the Stu's job, isn't it? Well, it, it definitely is. I, you know, uh, we won't mention any names right here at the moment, but I, I can tell you that uh, there were a couple of races yesterday where, uh, you know, the gathered press in the press box were commenting on a particular rider oh, I can't who wait. Uh, tends to ease up, you know, uh, right before the wire, costing his horse a finish. Carry, we won't mention any names. No, I'm sure that you're. You know, you're probably familiar with the rider yeah. that we're talking uh, about. But 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 the the gentleman brings up a point. I mean, hey, you know, 30 years ago when all you had is win, play, show. But now, I mean, we we're into not only trifecta, superfectas, right. pentafectas. Yeah. So if 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 the racing jurisdiction or the the, the people in charge are going to offer those races. At where the fifth place finish can meet a million dollars, you know, a half a million dollar score if there's a carryover and a pentafecta. It has to be impressed upon the participants, the jockeys in this case, and hopefully the horses, that, you know, they got to, they're not just riding for first, second, or even third. Fifth place matters. So that, I don't, I, I agree with the gentleman that that to me hasn't been addressed as well as it should by the stewards in conjunction with the jockey community. Okay, uh, we're going to go to Plattsburgh, talk to Dan. Dan, thank you for your patience. Welcome to the show. Question or comment? Uh, a question. Yes, sir. Okay, um, twice in the last week, um, right in the shadow of the wire, uh, first of all, it was um, Hill uh, moved his goggles and came in second. He had the, the race won. He reached up to get his goggles, lost the race. And on Monday, the race nine on 818, the number nine horse, Saltwater Rain, I don't uh, recall the jockey's name, um, was out in the middle of the track, dashed right into the, you know, right near the rail and within the shadow of the wire, uh, moved his goggles up and, and the horse just stayed there. <laughs> Is this a new way to lose? Or I, I well, I, th thanks for the call, uh, Dan. Uh, you know, there are a million ways to non-win, and before the day is over, there'll be at least one more. Uh, but the, but the, uh, the, the, the question there is, uh, you know, they got to see where they're going, and uh, I'm not going to question. I'm not going to question that. I, I don't know how to question. It. I don't ride horses. Carrie, uh, any thoughts on that? I, I really don't. I think you know. It's, it's easy to criticize these guys, you know, from a distance, but unless you've really ridden a horse in a race, you, you, you really don't know 
what these people are going through. I mean, to me, jockeys <laughs> on balance are some of the most courageous athletes in all of sports. And, and it, you know, it, it's easy for us to sit back. He should have done this. But until you're riding on a 30, you know, on a, on a thousand pound animal going 30, 40 miles an hour in between horses, I'm not sure all, you know, we're really qualified, you know, and, and dirt's flying in your eye. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for us to say what's the right thing to do is. But I think until you've done it, you know, you gotta you gotta give them a little, cut them a little slack in certain situations. But you know, this is, you know, your safety or you know your eyesight might come before winning a race. I think I think it has to come down to character. I, I know what the caller's talking about, a, a different race uh, than the one that he mentioned. Uh, uh, I was watching a horse that I picked the other day, and he was second outside of the pace setter, and a third horse ranged up alongside both of them. And the jockey on the horse I picked was adjusting his goggles just as the other horse ranged up, and you know he he wasn't able to, you know to, to urge his horse because and right. but but the bottom line is it's like baseball or any other sport. Sometimes you hit a routine ground ball and it hits a pebble and bounces over the exactly. fielder's head. These right. these are all parts of the sport, and you either have to accept them. As you know, the the good with the good with the bad, you hope that they even out for you over time. But you know, I, I agree with you completely. You know, the jockey has to be able to see, and if he can't see, right. it's trouble for everybody. Which, which again, <laughs> fellows, is why um, price is so important. Yeah. Because uh, so much uh, can interfere with a short price horse. Right. Uh, we're going to go to Staten Island and uh, talk to Ron. Ron, thank you for your patience. Question or comment? Well, I have two questions. The first question is regarding this uh, coupled uh, entries. Yes, sir. In the uh, Travers, you had Robert LePent on three horses. They all were uncoupled. Yep. The race before that, the King's Bishop, you had the 1-1-A binary stables coupled. How do you explain or what is the reasoning why they didn't couple the LePent entry in the uh, Travers? You know, Cool Coleman, uh, Amped, and uh, Datara. And my other question, just if you care to indulge in it, is I missed the uh, referring to the ride and the ninth race yesterday, the turf race. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, if I go by just what I saw, I mean, I, I guess it's DeSormo, but I know you didn't want to divulge the name of the jockey, but I kind of missed the uh, trying to call you, missed the commentary. So if you want to address that, fine. But anyway, my main question was about the entry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. The, I, uh, t caller, I, I've forgotten the exact rule. I mean, there's so many rules, right. you know, that you'd have to carry uh, the rule book in your back pocket. Uh, I, I may well be there. I think there are certain million dollar races right. or certain elevated stakes races where the normal coupling rules for other races don't apply. And, you know, I, I'll go back to what I said before. I don't think there <laughs> should be coupling in any races other than, than claiming races where you might. You know, if you're, you're trying to sell a, a bad favorite or something like that. Uh, but I, I just think that coupling is a bad thing. Uh, we, as members of the racing media, have done a terrible job trying to inform and educate readers and viewers about why coupling hurts them. And the bottom line is, is it's kind of simple. If they're uncoupled, there's more betting interest. You should, be, you should be the person that has to decide, do I like trainer A's horse? or trainer A's other horse, you know, no, and, and not and, some but, rule book. But even beyond that, Nick, I must, you know, uh, laud New York how they handle when part of a couple of entries scratches. Right. I mean, it's in some of these places, it's ridiculous. Right. Kentucky, you could have an entry with a one to five shot by himself and a 30 to one shot by himself. So they're one to five on the board. Mm -hmm. at, a, at, at the gate, the one to five scratches and you're still left with the other right. horse. It's, yep. At that, at one to five. That's no protection as no, far that's, as I'm uh, concerned. You know, so there's right. just another reason to, mm -hmm. you know. To, I agree. Well, you know, but that, uh, uh, you know, kind of addresses the larger issue of we need a lot of more standard. You mentioned the prices. Here's a thing on entries. I mean, I really think what this game needs to move forward, and, and we're trying to do it with this panel, you know, this NTRA thing of getting the withholding tax up the threshold, moved up to 25,000, the coalition. Yeah. We need a little more, I'm not a federalist at heart by any means, but I think and for our game to move forward, we need to centralize some of these issues and not have every place has a different way they report prices, different entry rules, different Medicaid, it's, 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 it's right. just, it's Here, not. Let me, let me yeah. just jump in too, because this is a perfect point 
to bring up something that I wrote about earlier in the meet, and you know, and you are you're on the NTRA players yeah. panel, you know, and they've they've started kind of their horse player coalition and that sort of thing. One of the things that we're up against in in horse racing as fans is racetrack management, you know, for good or evil, has always sided with the horseman over the the, the patron, and that's the one thing that I think is going to be the toughest nut to change. We had, you know, we had the, the, the coupling rules here, which, you know, co uh, conflict with the superfectas in certain races. Now, no argument, the rule ought to be changed so that you can have a coupled entry in a superfecta race. But the bottom line is, is that racetracks, Naira, other tracks, uh, side with the horsemen over the fans. And the bottom, it, it's, it's kind of in their DNA. As I wrote in my column, I'm, you know, most racetrack officials, many racetrack officials, mm -hmm. particularly those in the racing office, either have trained, have family that have trained or ridden. I mean, you know, they're they're part of the backstretch in well, effect. They are. And, they're trying to keep the horsemen happy. You know, and the bottom line is the fans pay the price. Exactly. We're going to go uh, down, uh, actually, we're going to stay in uh, Saratoga. We're going to talk to Mike, who's a shipper. He shipped in from Long Beach. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Mike. Uh, hey, guys. How are you? Terrific. Um, you've been talking about jockeys and how they're athletes, and um, it's a big part of handicapping. Now, I remember when Steve Cawthon was Athlete of the Year on, and on the cover of Sports Illustrated, arguing with my friends that they're saying jockeys are an athlete. Mm. Obviously, they are. My point being that it has to be part of your handicapping because like Mott's having such a bad meet and I think one of the reasons he's having a bad meet is I think Kent DeSormo since you know you know what, what happened with Big Brown this guy's just like snaked it he's just not riding and you, you, now you have to think about when you're looking at a horse do I not bet this horse because DeSormo for whatever reason just you know he's in a slump almost like A-Rod's in a slump or anyone else how do you guys formulate that in your I'll take that even from a player's perspective. I mean, I do this for a living. I bet for a living. And I have had the last month more bad beats <laughs> than I can remember in the last 10 years. Now, but that's going to happen. I don't care if you're Kerry Fodius betting on the horses, Bill Mott training the horses, a jockey riding horses. When you're sitting there, like me betting every day or someone else riding every day, training every day, if you're doing this for 20, 20 30 years, you're going to catch a stretch where just statistically every break goes against you for a while. Just like my feeling is when you're hot, you're not really as good as you think you are. And when you're <laughs> cold, you're not really as bad as you think you are. To give you an example, I've lost out of the last 24 photos that were for me $500 or more, I swear, I've lost 23 of them, all right? Now they'll come a stretch, well I'll win 20, you know, 18 straight photos or something. But the idea is, people when they pick a winner that, hey, people that bet Colonel John, oh man, I had him off this number or this or that or that, whoever I picked him, hey, he was a great bet. No, what you were, you were lucky to win the race. Just like people, when they win, they think they're smart. Well, they're not that smart. A lot of times, you just get lucky, and it's it's the same thing with jockey. Now, when if the mental part of it starts affecting you, then you got a problem. Right. But if I can sit there and say, I don't, hey, I've lost 26 races in a row, but this horse today is value at 12 to one. I'm betting that horse. But there's a couple of things here. I mean, yeah. first of all, Billy Mott didn't forget how to train. Exactly. And uh, he's going to get his share of wins before the, uh, he'll get some more wins before this meet is over. And the Soma probably didn't forget how to ride, but right. it's what you said, a cycle. We're going to go to Brooklyn, talk to Anthony. Anthony, thank you for your patience. Welcome to the show. Question or comment? Yeah, good morning, Nick. Good morning, Anthony. Carrie and Tom. Good morning. Good morning. Nick, especially, I think you're doing a good job. Thank you. My question is, one of the biggest problems I have, why in the big trees, you could have a special big tree, but in the big four, they have forced you on a horse that you did not like, which is the favorite, and give you the favorite in the big four, but they can't have a special big four, but they have a special big tree. What's the difference? Okay. Uh, Excellent question. Right. Excellent question. That's about the console, right? Uh, right. Versus yes. catching the right. favorite. Uh, we're, I think our, I think we're with you on that one, aren't we? Yeah, and I think, Kerry, that, that's one of the things that I, I think that you folks in the players panel have tried to address, things like that. Uh, and if I recall, 
Uh, you know, either racetracks uh, have taken no action or they've been stymied by uh, state regulation that prevents them from taking action. And I think that's one of the things that Anthony's talking about here. The state regulation requires that it's done the way that it's done and it's just slow to change things. Well, here's one for you. How about, you know, you play an early, a daily double, right? There's a dead heat in the second race. Ever notice how you get different payoffs? Mm -hmm. How about once I had a pick six, I didn't have the even money shot, but I had the 15 to one shot. Right. They dead heated, and the guy who right. had the even money shot got the same. Right. Hey, exactly. you can do it in a double. Why can't you do it in a pick three, a pick four, a pick six? Why I mean, can't you? you be, because people the, no, people don't complain enough, and, and, and the regulatory issues, and, 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 and the and politics. I, and and, I, and I, let me bring up, uh, too, an issue that's dear, near and dear to my heart based on it. We got an email here. You know, the emailer wants to know why is the minimum pick six bet $2 as opposed to $1? And I think, you know, that's almost not the question. The question for me is why has not American horse racing embraced fractional Actually. betting? like they have in other parts of the world where you go to the windows you say I want to box this horse with that horse or I want to play this pick six or picks four and the teller says that's going to cost you $128 and then you say well I want 30 percent of that. Let me, let, me, let me, my take on that is I agree there should be fractional betting in any race except the pick six and I'll tell you why. Because the lure of the pick six is to get the big carryovers, and if you allow fractional betting in the pick six, you're not. Every, you're gonna, okay, you're so not, but outside the pick here's six, my yeah. question for you on that one: right. Is it better to have one person win two hundred thousand dollars or ten people win twenty thousand well, dollars? Well, well, well. In in terms of churn at the track, it's better to have ten people win twenty thousand. But in terms of getting. But you you won't you'll get that back, but you have to balance that off against you're not going to have two million carryovers with people betting six million into the pool like they do at Del Mar because uh, there's not in other words that's what lures that big money in there is the chance for a seven a figure score changing right score. you're going to get away basically with so it's, a life changing it's the equivalent score of hey, I, the, way, the way the last few days have gone for me I feel <laughs> I feel a win bet on a, on an even money shot is a life changing score oh by the way before we move further here. I just want to, kind of, whether it was people calling in or this crack tech staff back there, my name has gone from K-E-R-R-Y to C-A-R-R-Y. You got it. It's right now. C-A-R-Y. Look at that. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to take this call, and then uh, we're going to take a brief commercial break. And when we come back, Kerry, uh, you know, Kerry Fotius is a man who uh, I know owns the largest collection of small numbers. And uh, I know you got a, you got something you like on today's card. We're going to let you talk about uh, a race or, or something you like. So, uh, Anthony from the Bronx, you've been patient. Thank you very much. What's on your mind? Question or comment? Hi. I just have a comment. Yes, sir. That racing is the greatest. I mean, these races are tremendous. What a rush that you get. When, when you watch these races, it's better than any lottery, you know, you, you, um, and you're alive in these races, it's better than anything else, and yet racetracks cannot market this. They don't have a, a, you know, their idea is giveaways. Gamblers don't go to their tracks with giveaways, the t-shirts, they go just for the action, for the best, and if they can only market this, have racing for the next 15 years. A lot of these websites are saying, you know, racing has for 15 years. If they don't market it, uh, excellent, okay. ex excellent point, Anthony. Uh, you know, I just think we're going to have to. You, you know, the uh, uh, the parallel is is to uh, poker. Uh, I, I think for the longest time that uh, racing has been reluctant to emphasize the action and the gamble, and um, exactly. the the rise of poker and the popularity of that. Uh, on television and on the internet and so on, uh, ought to be a signal that uh, gaming and the action is not all that bad. Karen? No, I mean, that's the game is never going to prosper until the take comes down, until you make it much. I mean, to me, there should be a number you should be able to call up, 1-800-HORSE-BETS or something. And it's, you have a clearinghouse, you know, just, you, and you know how the tracks get paid? By how much money they handle, and you know what that was going to determine that? What kind of product they put out and how they treat their customers. Okay. And that's it. That's, that's, right. I mean, you got, you got to wake up, guys. You missed the television revolution. Don't miss the next one. Well, we're going to take a commercial break. we got a caller on the line. We'll uh, please hang on, and then, Carrie, you're going to talk about a race today. We'll be right back.
We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom Amello, Nick Kling, handicapper Kerry Fodius here on the backstretch of Saratoga. We're going to take the call from Tom in Albany, and then Kerry's going to talk about the feature. Tom, welcome to the show. Question or comment? Uh, comment. Yes, me. sir. Uh, I want to talk about the jockeys for a moment. Sure. You know, to these guys, this is a business. They have to show up every day. Okay. If they don't perform, if they don't show up, they lose their clients. Mm -hmm. All right. As many times I'm sure we've all gone to work. <laughs> basically just bolt through the day because we didn't feel well. This happens to these guys too, you have to understand this. They get injured, it might not be a dramatic injury, but it's enough that you're not getting 100% that day or the next day or for a week, whatever it may be, but they still have to show up, they still have to be there, because there's always somebody that'll take their place. And if they lose a client, like a Billy Mott or a, a Suge McGahee, hey, you know, that's a hell of a lot of money to lose. No, and, and, and excellent point. Yeah, Thanks to, for the call. And you have to respect these guys, like the gentleman caller there says, because, hey, they don't have guaranteed. Ba even Bailey doesn't have a guaranteed contract. He's got to go out there and earn it every day. Right. And if he gets hurt and somebody else gets hot taking his place, uh, you know, just look at the bounce Gomez took from Velazquez over the years. I, I, I don't know about you, you know. guys, but uh, when I drive to work or when I go to work, there isn't an ambulance following me. <laughs> there isn't? <laughs> there isn't. I may have an accident, but there isn't. Oh, yeah, he's following. younger than we thought. I <laughs> thought it was an ambulance. Maybe it's the cops that there are following me. Carrie, let's talk about the feature. Well, the, the features, uh, I always love this race, the ballerina. But just before I get into this, if you don't think pace makes the race, last night about 10.30, I was watching the end of the marathon at the <laughs> yeah. Beijing Olympics. Yeah. And this, you know, this Kenyan guy came in way ahead of the field. Then some Ethiopian guy came in. And when the third and fourth guys caught, were coming through the tunnel, my buddy Kit said, this guy in third's a dead piece. Because, right? <laughs> no, the other guy was like 100 yards behind him. But this guy was just like straggling, right? And this guy, and sure enough, you know, he, th th this guy was like, the, 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 he caught him for the bronze, and the poor guy that finished fourth, I mean, he barely could even do you, do you make, make it. Do you make figures? No. <laughs> All right, do the race. Yeah. And then we got but, one uh, last call. Yeah. But this race here, I do think Pace will make the race. You know, a lot, most of the time in this race, you get quite a bit of speed. And, uh, you know, Bayou's Lassie, you know, shows speed, but that's on the turf. I just don't see a lot of speed in this race, and for that reason, I think Sugar Swirl's going to be pretty tough here. You know, I mean, she can take the lead if she has to. She can stalk. Problem is, she's going to be the favorite. I think the horse to make some money on here, and the way I've been running, I'm going to play her mostly underneath, you know. <laughs> like, if I could bet, like, to lose by a nose of Leah's Secret at 6 to 5, but I'm going to use Leah's Secret, you know, with Sugar Swirl in, in exact as in triples, but I think, you know, I have a little win bet on the three. It's Pletcher. She's on a good pattern on the Equiform numbers. She's 12 to 1 on the morning line. The Pletch is having a good beat. I don't know if there'll be enough pace to set it up, but a lot of times these races don't shake out. Somebody goes out with a deuce or something. So, But at 12 to 1, is, is to me, is definitely some value. Okay. Uh, our last caller, we're going to go to Gloversville talk to Ed. Ed, welcome to the show. Question or comment? Question. Yes, sir. Do you see on their overweight and they say like one pound over, yep. two pounds over. Okay, what's the overweight on? Is it on the jockey, or are they carrying more weight, or what? It's the, jo it's the jockey. The jockey, the can't, jockey make can't make the, make the, weight, the weight printed in the program, Ed. So in other words, if horse A is supposed to carry 117 pounds, when the jockey tacks up, he's weighing 118 pounds, and that's where the plus one comes from. Okay, that's going to bring us to the end of this show. Uh, I want to thank Kerry for joining us. It's always great to see him here at Saratoga. This has become almost an annual event, Sunday with uh, Kerry. Boy, there's a, I, I, there's a title <laughs> for a TV show. And, uh, you know, you can uh, log on to Equiform.com, find out about uh, the extras. And uh, also, you can read Blinkers Off. It's a very interesting book. And uh, if you've evolved in this game, in Kerry's book, you'll find yourself. Uh, Nick Kling, he'll be back next week with me. Nick and I will be here Wednesday for our final Track Facts Wednesday on the Saratoga meeting. And then we'll be here next week to uh, wrap it all up for you. So we want to thank uh, the guys here on the set. That's, uh, that's Peter standing right in front of me. Oh. And Peter, yes. And Jim in the studio or uh, in the trailer. And uh, Danny and Patrick down in the studio. I got it all right. Thanks for watching. Have a great day. Get four to one on all your bets, and let's hope Leah's secret doesn't lose a photo. Have a great day. Oh, today I wanted to get outside. If you have any comments or suggestions, please write to the general manager at the OTV Television Network, 510 Smith Street, Schenectady, New York, 12305.
This is the OTB Network. Tom Gallo talks about racing partnerships. It allows you to have an ownership interest in an athlete, in a professional athlete, that doesn't renegotiate his contract, doesn't become a free agent. We're talking about horses. We're talking about the beauty and the athleticism of these wonderful athletes. I want to bring more people into this. I'm saying to myself, listen, you got to try this. You got to try it. This is great. This is fantastic. Join Saratoga's original racing partnership. Visit us online at partingglassracing.com.